Good. Yeah. Good evening. This is Pamela Petschke. It is six o'clock on the dot, and I call the meeting to order of the Southwick Town Granville Regional School. I have a motion to open the meeting. Second. All right. And I guess we'll do a roll call vote to open the meeting. Pat? Yes. Ted? Yes. Ryan? Yes. Eric? Yes. And that's right. Yes. Myself, CF. Yes. Motion time. One, two, three, and four, five, six of us, six zero zero. Okay. All right. So now I will entertain a motion to accept the meeting minutes for the October 14th, 2022 school committee. Uh, yeah. Oh, you're right. Thank you. Just skip that part. Forgot about the pledge. Let's stand for the pledge, folks. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, now I will entertain motion to accept the meeting minutes for the October 4th. Sorry. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Regarding these minutes. All right. Show of hands to accept the meeting minutes. I'll see. Okay. So five yes, one abstention. Okay. And the warrants are here. You no, know, I have yet to sign. Has anyone else yet to sign the warrants? Okay. So. I'll take care of it after you. Thank you. All right, correspondence. I do. Um, I just received um, a letter from the Town of Southwood Planning Board. Um, because we're a property owner within 300 feet of One Hudson Drive, which is the additional attic public storage incorporated, they're going to be constructing six self storage buildings um, at the site. And by the bylaws, they have to inform us that they're doing it. And if we have any questions, they are holding a hybrid public hearing uh, planning board meeting on October 25th, 2022 at 720. It really doesn't affect us. It's right down the road. Um, but I just wanted to let make you aware uh, that we were notified and that there is a planning board meeting. And if anybody is interested, I have the Zoom uh, a link right here, and I can send it to you. What are these storage? There's six uh, constructing six self storage buildings with associated site improvements. And so, for correspondence, mm -hmm. it is okay. So it is now time for our first public comment. Um, if there is anyone here that would like to make a public comment, please first state your name and address for the record, and then the floor is yours. All right, seeing none, that brings us to our students. Mm -hmm. Up next is our student advisory report. All right. So this week is full of senior nights. Uh, boys soccer was yesterday versus Chicopee at Wally Park. Cross country was today, starting at four. Girls soccer is tomorrow night at Wally Park versus Northampton. And girls volleyball is on Friday. Uh, Rams are looking to play outside the regular season in Western Mass and state tournaments. And the last two games this week helped determine everyone's rankings. And winter sports signups are open on family ID. There's also an open house that was a big success at the middle school level, and lots of families came to see their teachers. And then conferences are next week, and teachers are doing them either in person or via Zoom. Uh, we had the PSATs last Wednesday. The ASVAB test is next Friday, and then there's a field trip for juniors and seniors to a mini college fair at Westwood High School next Tuesday. You're in my trial. Oh, so I was about to ask, hey, can I borrow <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
The freshman class of 2026 is holding a Halloween dance later this month. Just them, not the rest of us. <laughs> the student council is still looking to plan a sphere week. We made a little progress, but it's still getting there. And homecoming for freshmen and sophomores is coming up soon. We're also working on a pep rally, but you know, it's kind of difficult what with, you know, haven't done one in like two years. So we're trying to work out the specifics and such, but we're getting there. So hopefully that's gonna go down as well. And another largely two uneventful weeks have passed at SRS. We're still happy to have another two weeks under our belt. <laughs> <laughs> two weeks of stuff. Is the Halloween party, is that seventh and eighth grade or is that uh, it's the freshman? But I don't know, I overheard some things. It almost <laughs> sounded like they were doing something for the seventh grade. Yeah, because yeah. there's another one for seventh yeah. and eighth yeah. graders. I don't know. They coincide with one another or not. I was just curious. There's just a Friday. Friday. Oh, it's a it's a separate day. Yeah. All right, so that brings us to our educational presentations. We have quite a few educational presentations tonight. Um, the first is the Superintendents Awards. This is like one of my favorite ones to do. And I love doing it because it's the beginning of the year and it's just it's so exciting uh, to see a, a senior who's worked so hard, especially during the past few years with COVID. It, it's even more special this year to be giving out the Superintendents Award. So this year, the Superintendents Award, it's given out each year to the member of the senior class who graduates with the highest cumulative grade point average. This year, I am pleased to present the Superintendents Award to Catherine Stevens. I'll tell you a little bit about Catherine. Catherine's ambition for learning has seen her rise to the top of her class academically. During her SRS career, she's been awarded the I Dare You Leadership Award, AP Scholars Award, and is a member of the National Honor Society. Out of the classroom, Catherine has been an active participant in the regional school community. She is a member of the Varsity Alpine Ski Team and a varsity cheerleader. She's also a member of the International Language Club, Model UN, the math team, and Girls Who Code. Catherine is active outside the school in the Granby 4-H Club, where she is the current president and participated in Global Glimpse and the United States Naval Academy Summer STEM Program. I wish you the best of luck in the future, and I know your dedicated work ethic and your ability to excel at everything that you do are just exactly what you need to succeed in life. So it's my pleasure to present Catherine Stevens, the Superintendent's Award. Congratulations. Thank you. I can't wait to see you in June. <laughs> <laughs> the award ceremony. Yeah. <laughs> it's so nice to see a picture of that on the mask. I know. I think this is my first picture of that mask. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, okay. Our next educational presentation is our school resource officer. Um, so I'm going to welcome Officer Kyle Sanders to From join Center us. Center. Right. That's so why I've met a few of you already. Do you want to do a quick little intro? Absolutely. Sure. Can. So as part of our uh, MOU, Memorandum of Understanding with um, the local police we, for our SRO officer, part of it is to let the community get to see who our uh, SRO is and get a little to know a little bit about him. And so I thought there'd be nothing better than to bring him to our school committee meeting where it's broadcast, the community can watch it, it's on YouTube, and everybody can really see how amazing Kyle is and what he adds to our school. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, how's it going? I met a few of you earlier tonight and a few of you I've known for a little while now. Um, We're neighbors. <laughs> so just to go uh, back a little bit, I graduated from Southwick in 2007. So there's a lot of reasons why I'm happy about being in the role. I've gone through these schools myself. It's a pretty incredible thing when kids say, like, you don't know what I've been through. I sat in that same, that same room. <laughs> I've had a lot of the same teachers. <laughs> um, I graduated from the full-time police academy in 2015. Uh, uh, 
fortunate thing for me during COVID is that I was given the opportunity to step into this role. Um, 2020, Sergeant Taggart had to step away due to childcare issues and everything like that. So the position opened up and I was fortunate enough to have um, been given an opportunity to take on the role. It has been a blessing ever since. This is going on my third school year. Daily thing is I work between all three schools pretty much as I need it. And um, if there's opportunity to play kickball at Woodland School, then so be it. <laughs> um, for long, it's also kind of a, a dream thing for me as far as becoming a police officer and being able to work in the school so much. My father, many of you may know, was a DARE officer in town for as long as the DARE program existed. After that change, they created the Youth Challenges program. So there's no better person for me to be able to call and ask mm -hmm. than my father. So um, all, all in all, it's a, it's a great experience for me. I enjoy working with all the administrators daily, Superintendent Willard, and yeah, it's it's truly a great experience so far. Nice. Now, does anybody have any questions for me at all? Are you full-time? I am. So, so um, yep. So during the school year, I'm Monday through Friday at the schools. I, um, um, yeah. So the last couple of years have been challenging with staffing and stuff like that. Not last year so much, but the year before as far as being with the schools the whole time. But yes, so Monday through Friday, I'm, I'm always here unless I'm pulled away to somewhere else. But yeah, I'm <laughs> exclusive to the schools for for while schools in session. And thank you for coming to the accident when I was rear-ended <laughs> with schools. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> My car's fine, but the porch was crumbled. <laughs> it was incredible to see this newer SUV just crumble, and then the, yeah, and then the bumper was just kind of dented on her. So you have your well be well built vehicle. I drive Ford. <laughs> Yeah. Superintendent, well, we can add something. Yes. I, I mean, Kyle's being extremely humble in, in his role right now. He does an awful lot for all of our schools. I can speak for what he does up at SRS. I mean, it's 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 not out playing kickball, but it's out directing traffic in the morning and the afternoon. Mm -hmm. It's it's sitting in on on phone calls to parents with myself and other administrators if there's issues of concern around. Um, uh, social media issues, bullying issues, um, investigating whether there's there's weapons accessible to students or to families. Um, he's always right next to the administrator in the office making these phone calls with the parents. We were just on a Zoom the other day of an, uh, around an I interrupted an IEP meeting to have uh, a discussion around some sensitive material. Um, Kyle is does a tremendous job of following up on communication with with all parties, documenting. Uh, conversations that were had, uh, findings in investigations. He he really does his due diligence, making recommendations on um, getting DCF involved and when to get DCF involved. So um, he he really is an invaluable resource to us up at SRS, and, and I know the other principals feel the same way uh, with him in his role in the school. But he is uh, the kids like seeing him in the halls, the parents like seeing him in 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 front of the school and, and outside of school as well. Um, but in the office each and every day, he's a resource for the administrators as well as, as making sure that we're doing a, a diligent and thorough job in investigating all our, our situations up at the school. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you very you. much for joining us. Also, at this point, I'm going to step out. <laughs> Everyone has a good night. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank Congratulations. You. Congratulations. Have a good night, Grant. Did you get the pony now, right? <laughs> 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 I'm just going to go home and do homework. <laughs> All right. So next up, we have our Southwood Regional School 2022-2023 Site Strategic Plan. So, Mr. Tramel, you are up. I'm going to have uh, Ms. Shorter do uh, this presentation, and she does a lot of the the work and the planning around our professional development. She can speak uh, more intimately about the details of it, and then I'll jump in and do the MCAS yeah, one after that. Okay. Yep. Sounds great. So um, I'm just going to highlight some of the things. I mean, you, the, the the plan is 
um, been in place for a couple of years already. We, we have made some updates. So I'm just gonna kind of share the uh, what's new this year or what's uh, ongoing, what's new in the ongoing work. Um, in, in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, as well as engaged learning and uh, being a trauma-informed school, one of the things we have focused on, we started to focus on it last year and we are continuing it this year, is intentional lesson planning. So teachers have adopted for their goals to do formal lesson planning, which um, you may or may not know is something that you do in, in, in teacher preparation school, but once you get into the practice, it's, it's much less formalized of a practice. But our philosophy is if you wanna shift your practice, if you wanna get better at something, it's important to confront it in your planning. So by doing formal lesson planning, we're intentionally thinking about the shifts that we want to make. Um, as leaders of the school, it's very helpful for, for Joe and, and Mike and myself to uh, see those lesson plans so that we can have conversations with teachers um, that to improve their practice more than just walking through and seeing something, we can see their thinking in writing. And so the focus of those lesson planning is to do the content learning target. So that would be the traditional curriculum target, but also to have a social emotional learning target. So, um, for example, I might be teaching um, students, you know, we might have a social studies topic and we're talking about debate or I'm sending students into groups to have group discussion. But have we specifically taught them how to have a discussion and given them tools like a protocol for how you debate something together. So the second target might be, or the social emotional learning target might be one about explicitly teaching students how to have that conversation. So if that's happening in a social studies class and then an English teacher also uses a similar target and then maybe um, in science they have that target. Now a student's got it in three places and so it starts to become something that they really know, how to talk about certain topics uh, in that academic setting. Um, and, and that's part of our, our social emotional learning. Uh, culturally responsive practice as well. Um, a, high, a high focus of that is, is keeping the rigor high. So we don't lower the bar when we think students can't do it. We keep the bar high and we get students to reach that. So building things into, um, into the lesson plan that help to maintain the bar high. And when students aren't, aren't reaching it, what scaffolds are you building in to, to help them get it? So not just saying, oh yeah, I do that, but really looking at where I'm doing it and how I'm doing it. Um, so that is a focus and our instructional coaches are going to be doing some feedback circles with, with um, teachers where they can bring their lesson plans and share with one another and give one another feedback or come to sharing their lesson plans and saying, I thought this was gonna go really well, but it didn't go really well. What can you tell me about where I might have, what I could do better? So we're actually really looking forward to that. And, and teachers were actually asking for that. Uh, we were kind of on that path and then they were asking for it. So we're all on the same page with next steps for this. So we're feeling good about that. Um, in terms of guaranteed and viable curriculum, something that we've brought in at this point is in world language. We have over the last two years shifted to proficiency based language. So it's not just, Spanish one, Spanish two, Spanish three, it's whatever Spanish you're in, the teacher's meeting you where you are and bringing you to the next proficiency level. Um, and so we've uh, instituted some common uh, benchmark assessments and we've brought in um, a, a standardized test at the end called the Apple test, which if students uh, perform at, a, at the highest level of that, they can get the seal of biliteracy on their diploma. So that is a measure of, um, you know, meeting the standards for being literate in the second language. Uh, so we feel excited about that. The, the teachers are, are learning how to really score those. Last year, we had our outside consultants score them to kind of get a baseline. And now she's working with teachers to get them uh, versed in doing that as well. So that's another good thing. We're continuing our work with Alex Hirschberg around trauma informed. He shifted it in the, at the regional school. He shifted his work from working with uh, the school counselors um, around tier two intervention to going and working directly with teachers around what they can do in the classrooms. And now our school counselors, since they've had training, are now able to push it in to the classrooms and support the teachers with their tier one. So this is a model we had in place, our plan we had in place for a few years, and now we're really going to see it come together this year. So we're excited about that. Um, and again, job embedded coaching is 
It is part of our model with PLC. So we've brought Alex Hirschberg, instead of doing presentations to the staff, he is meeting with them in their PLCs during their workday and doing that coaching with them about what's happening in the class. Let's go observe, let's talk about it, that kind of thing. Um, instructional technology, of course, we're continuing to use Zoom as a tool um, and with us. Family conferences as well. We're, we're continuing to offer that. Um, we found we find that it makes conferences accessible, more accessible for everyone. So if you can't make it to school for those afternoon conferences, you could zoom in from your workday. Or if you didn't have a vehicle, you could zoom in. So we still we do in person, but we're also doing that. Um, data collection and data tracking. So we're we're having some data meetings and our. Um, instructional coach Ben Taglieri is doing um, talking to teachers about looking at data, how to use the data, what data we want to be doing so that we can start doing instead of reactive intervention, a student's already failed or is already past the point that you know we would like to see them in terms of struggling to doing proactive. So how are we looking? What are we looking at our formative data? Are we looking at, you know, MCAS data for eighth graders. So this is what we just did this week. So MCAS data for eighth graders who are not meeting or partially meeting expectations. They're not going to take the MCAS again until 10th grade in, in English, say. But when they do take it in 10th grade, that will be for diploma. So rather than waiting until 10th grade to start talking about this and putting it on that teacher, we have highlighted those students who are in this category and we're intervening now. And so they'll, they'll have some additional support around the areas that NCAS has highlighted as, as a, a, an area of concern. And so we now have ninth grade and we have the first part of 10th grade to help students get where they need to be. So that's part of our new, not new, but that's how we're expanding our intervention model under MTSS. Um, uh, Garland Green, you know, our, our new tech director, he is uh, working with Mr. Tremel and the technology department um, around getting a maker space and a green room in our library spaces. So you may be familiar with two uh, spaces in the library that used to be uh, computer labs. And now that we're one to one, we don't really need that kind of computer lab space. So making those um, technology workspaces where we have different kinds of equipment and maker space and all of that. So um, my understanding is that we hope to have it this during the school year or some parts of it up and running. So let's look for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and the last piece about engaged learning, I mean, truly all of the other things, you know, the lesson planning, the diversity, you know, the things that I just talked about under viable curriculum and under um, equity and inclusion and being trauma informed, all of those things come together and that is what increases engaged learning. Um, so it's really not separate from, it's a part of all the things we're doing, but two things in particular, we've been talking about what are our highest leverage tier one practices, meaning things that we do in the classroom available for everyone. Not, you don't necessarily always do it, but if you see that your students need it, we don't need an ed plan or an intervention plan. We can do it for everyone in the classroom. What are those high leverage practices that are gonna give us the most growth or have the greatest impact? And we've been talking about feedback and we have researched it as a really, really high leverage practice. So um, our teachers are, most of them are engaging in student learning goals that have a feedback loop where they are going to look at and talk to students about the application of feedback. So you, you start an assignment, and, you, and I give you some written feedback, but then I follow up with you to make sure you're using the feedback. And if you're not, we talk about how to apply feedback instead of, I just tell you what you did wrong and then we never revisit it. So that is a practice that we are coaching teachers with and teachers have goals around. The second one is explicit instruction. So we say, you know, where did you explicitly teach this? And that goes back to when I talked about that intentional lesson planning with SEL, so we might say, have a discussion, but have we explicitly taught students how to have that um, discussion? So that's another really high leverage practice or research shows a high leverage practice in student growth. So those two things are a focus of everything we're doing in terms of instruction. Does anybody have any questions? I don't have one, and, and this is just my own question, but sure. when you said that the 10th graders are doing the NCAS, 
and that's for diploma. What does that mean? It means that in uh, all students in 10th in grade, well, in ninth grade science or ninth or 10th grade science, 10th grade math and 10th grade English need to meet competency determination from the state of Massachusetts mm -hmm. by getting a certain score on the MCAS. Yep. If they don't meet that score, they get a diploma. They don't get a Sorry, diploma. Certificate they, of completion. Yeah, so you get a certificate that says I completed high school, but I might not have met the standard. If you want a diploma from Southwick Regional School, one of the requirements is that you meet competency on MCAS. So if they don't pass it in 10th grade, mm -hmm. can they take it again? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they can take it at every opportunity um, until graduation time. And there's the EPP. And, and there's a, for student, there's an in-between where if you part, if you partially met the expectation, but not quite there, they don't have to retake it, but we have to do what's called an EPP, which they are taking courses or there's a plan in place to ensure that they are going to meet the standards through the coursework. Um, so then does that consider it a diploma? Mm -hmm. It does, but that is only an option for certain set of scores. So there's like a three tiers of scores. There's the meeting, the partially meeting, but within partially meeting, there's certain numbers that qualify for EPP. And then there's not meeting and not meeting is, is the problem area. And just to piggyback on that, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education at the beginning of the year, they just raised the competency determination for this, this ninth grade class. So when they take the ELA and they take the science MCAS, the, the score to pass is now being raised. So it's going to be even more difficult for our ninth graders um, to pass the MCAS. This, this is a new thing that was just passed at the beginning of the school year. So what we're counting on is that a proactive intervention um, will have all our students out there very ready for that, knowing that that's coming up. So those of us with ninth graders <laughs> got the same thing. You can wait till next year. But the truth is, those ninth graders don't. They don't know the old way, right. so all right. they know is the bar that we have. So right. we keep telling them you can do this, and this is great. They they will do it. So it's not that they had one bar and then we shifted it and they way through. So. In our last nine years, we haven't had a student not graduate right. Yeah. from right. passing the English or the math yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. at South Carolina. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have a high. <laughs> we we are Contest. talking this yes. year only yes. two or three kids that need to yeah. to, to take a, a makeup, and mm -hmm. and we have a strong intervention model in place for these students that yeah. usually on the the next try um, they meet they meet the passing score. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and ideally, we wouldn't want to put that stressor on them. Yeah. I mean, so the taking it again and again has been a, more of a reactive. And so in talking about being proactive, hopefully yeah. more of the students, not that we ever have large yeah. numbers in that situation yeah. anyway, but there's always a few. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay. All set, Mrs. Becky, can I go? Yes. All right. All set. Thank you. All right. Um, I you do have a copy of uh the, the seventh, eighth, tenth. Uh, ELA and math scores individually mm -hmm. um, in a comparison over the last five years to our our own school scores and our state scores. But I also provided a quick executive summary of the highlights from, from our uh, 2022 MCAS scores. Um, in grades 7, 8, and 10, which is our, our testing grade levels up at, at the regional school, um, English language arts saw 45% or better um, growth in our student growth percentile. Um, we really want to see growth in, in the 40 to 60% window. That is, that is strong, moderate growth. Anything above 60%, you're in a, in a, a very high growth area, um, which some individual classes will see, but overall to see 45% in all, all three grade levels in ELA across the board is, uh, means our teachers, are having an impact on our students. That, that's what our student growth percentile really measures is, is um, 
the material that our students are, are, are our teachers are putting in front of our students teaching every day, that they are retaining it, they are, they are applying it, and there are results that are happening through the MCAS test. So to see the 45% in, in ELA across the board is great. Um, in grade eight ELA, our highest percentage of students is percentage of students exceeding and meeting in the exceeding and meeting category is the highest it's been in the last six, six years since 2017. I wish I had that number. Yes. Yeah. So in 2017, if you combine our exceeding and meeting expectations, we were at 34 percent. That's grade seven. And if you go to grade eight, yeah. Yeah. So you can see here we're at 34 percent in the exceeding and meeting, and that's really what the state is looking at, combining those two categories. If you look at where we are in 2022, we're at 43 or 44 percent. So um, 10 points higher, given all the, the change and the interruptions that we've had with, with COVID the last couple of years and the testing. So and the state, yeah, you the state, so yeah. you're the data yeah. person. Like, I'm looking at the yeah. exact same thing. I'm mm -hmm. looking at meeting expectations. And if you notice, in, you know, we were always a little bit below the state. Mm -hmm. And then boom, 2022 above the state by yeah. a good good percentage mm -hmm. right there. Yeah. Our, our average skill score is higher than the state average just by a point, but that's the first time in I think I'm over the six years that we've actually scored our average score in eighth grade ELA has been higher than the state mm -hmm. average as well. So some some nice nice gains there in our, our meeting seating category. Um and the same for grade 10 in ELA. We are at 54% in 2022, and in 2019, uh, before the pandemic, we were at 47%. So uh, a nice jump there as well uh, for our grade 10 students in ELA. And we've been fairly consistent. They changed, uh, they changed the test, the, uh, the MCAS test in, in, in 2019, where you can see prior to that, our advanced and proficients we were at 96%, uh, 98%. So we were really doing a great job um, in ELA at that time in grade 10. And, and then we went to the next generation of MCAS. And we've had, um, we knew that there were going to be some dips, but in comparison to the state, we've been pretty consistent in, in ELA 10 across the board. In math, again, we saw closer to high growth across the board in grade seven, eight, and 10 math. We were 55% or better in our student growth percentile um last year which which is a really strong number um grade eight math increased in exceeding and meeting percentage by seven points and decreased the not meeting by seven points so we're moving uh in the right direction at, at both ends of the spectrum here um increasing our exceeding um almost by 10 percent which which is nice and grade 10 saw similar results in math Again, increasing our exceeding and meeting by seven points comparative to last year, and then decreasing our not meeting by 8% from 21 to 22. So that 13%, as you can see in 2021 in math, grade 10, uh, was high, that's high for us. I mean, even though it was in the state average last year, that, that is high for us as you can look at, we were at two, six, four. Um, that was a jump, but now back to, to uh, 5% which is only a couple of kiddos um, that we'll work on. But again, some solid movement on either way, either end of the, the spectrum. Um, skill score was higher than the state average. Our growth, 55, 54%, higher than the state average as well in 10th grade math achievement. Um, and then Ms. Peschke, be proud of our grade eight SPE <laughs> scores where our exceeding and meeting increased by 10% from from 21, uh, our 21 test or 22 set test. And 9% better than, than uh, the state and the warning and the failing. And again, our skill score higher than the, the state average. So I know it's confusing sometimes, um, student growth percentage. How is that calculated? And is it measuring the same cohort 
Yes. And their growth from the previous time they took the test or from the previous year or the previous test? It's the previous test. And it's, it's, it, the growth is measured against other students that scored similarly. So if-, if So how is growth determined? So it's looking at if you have uh, if you have a class of 100, yep. it's taking the and let's say the number that we're working on of is 500. 500 is exceeding, and it's going to take all the kids that scored around 490, mm -hmm. and they're going to put them together, mm -hmm. and they're going to see uh, in 2021 you all scored 490, and they're going to see where those kids that scored 490 in 2021, where did you score in in, in 2022. Okay. So you're not you're not comparing kids that scored low on it with kids that scored high on it. It's taking kids that fall in the same achievement category and seeing how well you achieve compared to others in that same category the, the next the following year. year. Okay. Okay. The following year. Gotcha. Great. And then what they do is for every teacher, student growth percentage, they call it a percentage, but isn't it's it a percentile? The, more right. Yeah. Isn't it more the median? Yeah. They, so what they do is they take all the student growth and they rank them from the highest students growth in the class to the lowest students growth in the class. And what they do is they go right in the middle, they pick out the median and that's the student growth percentile. For, yeah, percentile, percentile for the class. And now I'm second guessing what that I said that. So I, I yeah. have to look at that again. But that is how they figure it's, it's a big measure of yeah. kids that are reading not on grade level, but for, for able to test see mm -hmm. that they've made some significant growth, even if we weren't able to get them, you know, from wherever they started all the way up to grade level. Right, because the categories of exceeding meeting partially and not meeting, there's a 30 point window between each of them. So you could you could be at um, at 500 and not meeting expectations, but you might move to 525 the next year, still be at still be at not meeting expectations, but you grew 25 points. You improved by 25 points. That growth is going to be significant. So it's a, it's another measuring uh, tool, not just by achievement, but to see how you're how you're progressing um, in the classroom. So if, if your achievement, if our achievement levels are not at the level we want them to be, we at least want to see that our students are making progress towards the next achievement level. And that's what the student growth percentile helps us, helps us measure. Mm -hmm. So we have some, we have some really nice positives from, from last year's scores, which were from the, um, not the COVID year, the, the before. Half a year, right? We were in, we were out, year, right? Uh, yeah. Hybrid. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. The hybrid year. <laughs> yeah. um, so this is measuring our first year back last year after after not taking them in, in 20 and then the hybrid year last year. So um yeah. and there were some chat there were some behavioral challenges last yes. year. There were some some challenges in, in students kind of re-entering school and getting acclimated acclimated to expectations. And um, so to see seven to seven percent to ten percent improvement in in our meeting and um, exceeding categories is is a nice um, it's a nice result for our students and for our teachers as well because they, they did work so hard in 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 getting to the students back to to where we need them to be so um, some nice gains that we can be proud of across the board and what's your biggest challenge what do you want to work most on? Well, our biggest challenge is, um, as you can see, I did not highlight much as far as achievement in grade seven um, in ELA or math. We were in, we didn't we didn't decrease, but we didn't e increase either. We were really uh, right where we were in in two thousand and in twenty one. Um, we, we didn't see any real gains that we didn't see the seven to eight to 10% gains we saw in grade eight and grade 10 in ELA or, or math. Um, but there weren't something significant dips either. So um, that could be the, the transition from six to seven that, that students are still struggling with and we're still trying to identify again. And we need to measure cohorts as, as well. So what I'm doing is I'm giving you the picture of grades. Um, if we looked at last year's grade seven, they did pretty well. They're now grade eight this year. And as you can see, I have some highlights from grade eight. So I have I, their, their cohort that 
that hopefully when uh, we're back here in two more years, we're highlighting them in 10th grade as well because they've, they've been successful. So we need to look at, at grade seven uh, a little bit, but we found some we found some strong pockets of what we're doing or what we have been working on is, is taking some strong shape. Um, yeah. And I would say physics as well. We need to. Yeah. So there's a change in physics this year. Physics is, we used to do biology years ago. <laughs> we felt um, that biology measures test a number of, of standards. Um, and physics, there are fewer standards on it. A little more math, but fewer standards. Biology tests in February and they test in June. So if you took biology first semester, you could take the MCAS test in February. If you take the biology second semester, you could take it in June. Physics only tests in June. So our students that were taking physics first semester, they were having almost four months off before they took the test. We did some, mm -hmm. we did some tutoring. We did some after school programs, not seeing the results that we wanted to. The state is now offering physics in February. And June? And June. And June. Correct. So we're hoping that our students that are taking it first semester with the semester ending the last week in January and then going and taking it in June or um, February, that maybe we're going to see some, some uh, an impact or growth and some movement in the positive with, with that shift as well. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Oh, I think uh, time for the curriculum update. <laughs> this is Sullivan. <laughs> So I know that that's a lot of presentations to have in one night. I was supposed to come a few meetings ago and ran long, so I will keep it brief. And um, I just wanted to, at the beginning of the year, I like to just come before the committee and just update everybody in terms of where we are with our curriculum review cycle and with some new faces. I just want to sort of let you know how that process works. Um, all of these things are discussed at ILT for those of you that are on ILT, so this will be a little bit redundant for you. Um, but one of the things that I want to highlight is that over the past few years, there's been a lot of research that Destiny Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has been highlighting around how impactful um, putting high quality standards line instructional materials into teachers' hands is in terms of improving student achievement. Prior to that, they would give us standards to teach, but they would be very hands off about how we were supposed to go around to teaching it. And so what they, they used to actually ask us to do is to sit down, unpack our standards and write our own curriculum. Now you can imagine that when you're thinking about providing a consistent education across different uh, classrooms in one grade and then making it coherent as you move up the grade so that your experiences in one grade builds on in a, in a meaningful way, that is impossible to do as a teacher in a classroom with one prep period a day trying to sit down and figure this stuff out while engaging in um, you know, meaningful lesson planning that meets the needs of all your students. It's just, it's impossible. We all gave it our best shot when we were asked to do it, but we're, we're glad that Desi is embracing this, this shift. And so um, over the past few years, we have really changed the way that we look at our, um, how we review our curriculum and how we choose our curriculum. And we're, we're finally getting some momentum with some of that. So I just wanted to share with you where we were with that process. Um, but I will also mention, it's not just getting the materials and putting them into teachers' hands. They need sustained professional development and coaching on how to actually use the materials appropriately in the classroom. You can't just dump these, um, these programs into teachers' laps. You really need to, uh, to help uh, support that implementation um, by constantly revisiting it, in, getting into classrooms, looking at how things are going, and getting um, professional development for the teachers. So you'll notice that um, we've been working with Hill for Literacy. This is our second year with them. That's what they're doing to help us support our um, ELA implementation. They've begun with the K-6, to but as we begin our search, or we're in the process of searching for our new 
7 through 12 ELA curriculum, they're beginning to do some professional development with the teachers up at the regional school as well. And that's, I mean, if you see these, like we just purchased into reading, I'll talk about that a little bit more. They, the, they will describe it as the things that come of it as a Vegas buffet. They put everything in there that you could possibly ever want so that they can sell their product to as many districts as they can. And so you can't leave it to chance about which components each individual teacher will pick and choose to use out of the curriculum because then you lose the value of a core program, right? We are looking for consistency. And if we're inconsistently making decisions about which components we're gonna use, you know, we lose that value. So that's the other thing that Hill is doing is helping us work with the teachers to figure out um, what are what is this gonna look like in our grade five? What is this gonna look like in our grade six so that we can maintain that consistency, um, but not overwhelm people. So that is really um, how the curriculum process works now is that we get together um, as different little core curriculum groups, depending on what, uh, what grade level or content area we're looking at the curriculum at. And we're trying to figure out what do we want? What is the state looking for? What do we want as a district based on who we are and where are we? And then we come up with some parameters and priorities around the process. Sorry, I'm not really following my PowerPoint. Let me think about where you can be right now. <laughs> That's okay. Right there is okay. Yeah. Um, so, so we put together, well, I'm jumping ahead. I'm going to follow the PowerPoint and be and try to not make any crazy. Can well, you answer the next slide, please? Yeah. So I just wanted to, to highlight for you how curriculum really is pervasively important and um, relevant to all four of our district initiatives. Um, in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, having these materials provides an equitable experience to all our students because as Ms. Shorter mentioned, we're not, it, it eliminates um, the ability for teachers to pick and choose which students are getting what because we're, we're providing some standardized materials and we make sure that we're holding them to the rigor of the standard and not not sort of bringing it down. And anytime teachers are doing this, they're doing it because they have the best interests of the students in mind. They don't want them to struggle. They don't want them to fail. They don't want them to feel bad about themselves. But it has a cumulative effect if you're always lowering the bar. So this is a real um, equity tool for us. Um, when you talk about guaranteed and viable curriculum, it's exactly what I just said. It means that the curriculum is, is it's reasonable to get through. You're going to do what you said you were going to do and that you're going to reasonably get the same thing whether you're assigned to Mrs. So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so, you're gonna get the, get the same high quality education. And this promotes our ability to do that and monitor that. Um, in terms of instructional technology, sorry, I just said later, laser eye surgery, not the kind that makes you see right away, so it's a little bit of a challenge. Um, in terms of instructional technology, it incorporates the knowledge, skills, and reasoning. Um, it, it is, we look for a program that helps to build those tools that are important for students to be successful in, in the world today and prepare them for things that are to come. And for engaged learning, um, it's helping us to build in, as Ms. Shorter mentioned, that multi-tiered systems of supports for all students. We're building that um, along with the, with the core programs. So um, this was what I was starting to talk about. Next slide, please, Amy. So, so how we go about looking at our curriculum now is that when it's their times, it's that grade level and that content area is time for us to look at it and there's a schedule that we follow loosely because we have to respond to changes and standards that come out from the state um, but we get a, a core curriculum group together we set some goals for ourselves we set some parameters such as what what we want to accomplish how much money do we have to spend that type of thing then we go and look at what's out there and we try to look at resources that have already been vetted by Ed Reports, which is a nonprofit company that follows some very um, detailed rubrics and they have teams of, of educators that just go through and, and score every program that's in that's published and they give it ratings on rigor and alignment to the standards, usability for the teachers and what's that? What's the third thing? Some third other thing that will come to me, but I'll keep moving until I can think of it. Um, and also um, to, we have now Curate who takes anything that's been Ed Reports approved and they'll only look at anything that's Ed Reports approved. And then they'll look at it through the Massachusetts lens because we are have um, some pretty high, high standards out there, especially, well, it's, I guess it's less now with Common Core, but 
we, we we even took common core and amped it up because we want to make sure that we're providing the best education to our students. So um, then once we've found a program that we feel meets our needs, we um, go through the plot process of um, implementing it. And um, that's all the stuff that we talked about, all the professional learning, all the decisions that we're making um, to make sure that it's being implemented appropriately in the classroom. And then after it's implemented, we're in sort of phase four, which is when we're monitoring how it's going and making adjustments as needed. And then we kind of coast along there until we something changes and we think we need to look at it again. So Amy, if you could go to the next slide, please. So this is sort of roughly how it, it's, it's currently mapped out. So if you look um, this school year, we are in phase one. So we've got a core curriculum team that's got them been brought together and is looking at um, what's out, what are our, what do we want and what's out there. And um, Amber Hall, our instructional literacy coach up at the regional school is actually a panelist on Curate. She was able to uh, apply and get chosen. So she's actually working with the state and then bringing all that great work that she's doing back to our own curriculum council. Um, I, we're also in phase one for K to six science, but this is accelerating a little bit um, in grades six, seven, and eight. Um, because um, Desi came out with a free open source curriculum that uh, we were looking at and, and the teachers got really excited about. So we're moving a little bit more quickly with those three grade levels. Um, and we're, I'm jumping ahead. No, I think 12 science. I think grade, grade spans are just a little off. And then we're implementing into reading, which is our core program um, for K to six literacy. And then we are, in the process of implementing and monitoring illustrative map and open open up resources mathematics vision project up at the high school for our math curriculum so <clears throat> so we're, we we've got a lot in place considering that we just started to use this process just a few, few years ago and it's going well and the teachers seem to um to really respond well to the professional learning and to having the, the resources is it saves them so much time having to dig up and try to make decisions for themselves about, you know, what's a good resource while they're trying to meet the needs of all the students that are in front of them. I have a lot more I could say about that, but probably no one but Ms. Shorter and Mr. Tremell would and Jen would be interested in doing that. <laughs> Just know we have a plan. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's super exciting. It, it's it's enjoyable work, and um, we're trying to keep the teachers as involved as possible, so that it really is their decision. It's their their important stakeholders in the decision making. I think the goal for myself would be to do a better job, um, uh, do a better job this year of communicating with all the stakeholders all the way through the process. I feel like I come in and update you guys periodically, but if you think there's anything more that I could be doing to be more transparent about how we are going about this. Um, please let me know, I'm open to feedback. Next up is, um, is social studies. Um, one of the things I will say is that what Desi's finding as they're moving, they've done ELA, they've done math, Ed reports and curate are now getting to science and social studies curriculum and what they're and, and English as a second language curriculum. And they're finding that there is nothing out there that even comes close to meeting their standards. So what they've begun to do for those subjects is partner with publishing companies and curriculum writers to create curriculum that then they're, they're going to give us for free and provide grants for us to get professional development for the teachers around that. So rather than Pay, pay money for something that's not up to standard, we might have to slow down some of the stuff to let them catch up. So for example, our science curriculum, right now they're only just releasing um, sixth, seventh, and eighth for that open sciad, um, but they're working on the high school courses and then next will be the elementary courses. So we'll kind of wait to see how we like that before we go running out and buying something because we know, you know we're not gonna waste district resources if something great is coming for free. And then they have um, investigating history. They're doing a pilot in grade five, six, and seven this year, but their plan is to also eventually go up and down with that as well. So we might want to, for some of those that, that when we look at the market landscape, there isn't anything, adjust our plan to, you know, to take advantage of the work that Desi is doing. So just be aware of that too. Plus we have new standards sometimes that come out. 
So for example, we're waiting for our health standards for like three, four years now, but we're being told this year. So like that'll change our plan a little bit um, because we'll need to make sure we are using the resources that we have to, to implement those changes as they arise. Another um, kind of point to, to sort of waiting, if DESE truly is in this process, is, you know, like if, if we think about the open Syed, um, there's so much of a pedagogical shift um, mm -hmm. with regard to phenomenon based and issues based. Mm -hmm. And that if, if that's the focus of how, you know, grades seven through eight are learning science, then ideally you want that absolutely follow through mm -hmm. at all grade levels, yeah. you know, absolutely. and, and you know, I'm most familiar with that, obviously at the science level, but if there's kind of a same sort of pattern in terms of a way that the teachers need to approach um, how we think about, you know, the, the curriculum and how we think about the way we want students to think, which is really what it is with regards to science. Um, the same thing may hold true for social studies as well. Absolutely. And, and, and they're very built around um, like the science and engineering practices, which um, I think that's the piece that's been missing in the commercially available. Program. Exactly. And so, um, and so listen, if the, we're, we're, we're always trying to be in line with what Desi wants us to be doing. And if they, and they're, I, I love that they're putting their resources towards creating these open source curriculum for us so that, and giving us guidance, like why, why make us all figure it out individually, each district for instead her. of just helping us, you know what I mean? I can ask questions, sure. it's like a comment and a question. So the, the committee will find it challenging to get deep into the weeds with you on this curriculum stuff, but where they can play a role is in providing the financial resources through development of a, of a budget that that responsible and, and provided resources, you know, meets the, stays within the, the confines of what the towns can provide and state funding, but gives you the resources you need. Um, do you anticipate that the uh, financial resources required to keep up with the, bringing these new uh, high quality instructional materials on board uh, what we have now in terms of financial resources can be sufficient or is they going to have to step up um, add more funding in the future? I don't know if more yet. Um, one of the things that is different now is that used to be that you'd have a, I have a budget line for curriculum materials and supplies. And, you know, it, in the past, it used to be like, okay, we're looking at social studies this year. And so you go out and buy a social studies textbook and you have that textbook until you went and found it was social studies turn again. Well, now a lot of uh, this, these curriculum materials aren't physical textbooks. They're online licenses. subscriptions and licenses that need to be maintained year after year. And so we might just need to shift uh, th our thinking about how we budget for it. Uh, but it, I don't, I haven't yet figured out, Steve, if that means more money for me or if, or if I can switch some other things around, maybe I have uh, lines that I manage that are not so relevant for that to be that high anymore. So well, I'm gonna, I'd like us to talk together about that and think about that. What would be helpful is to kind of have um, a, a table of, you know, what the, well, what the departments are, what they're using, and then like how many years the license is good for. You know, like I know, like for for me, like we've got a teacher's license for the curriculum that's good for seven years, but then we have to renew the student licenses every year. Right. And like you have to keep track of that. You have to keep track of when that's up. You know. Yeah. And that's just for one, you know, one grade span right. and yeah. one subject area. So what about all the rest? You know, and and having all of that information kind of together in one document. Um, so that we can at least kind of get a handle on where we're spending the money, when we're spending the money, how we're spending the money. That's a great idea, Pam, and I'll put something together like that for ILT because I need to, I need to have, I mean, it's in my mind, I need to remember to, to budget for these things, but I don't, I, I don't have it clearly like spelled out. The other piece of it, Steve, is that um, Garland uh, is going to want to really weigh in on some of these online programs that we've brought in in terms of data, data, uh, data privacy. And so we may want to switch the types of programs we're using based on his feedback as well. So, um, so that so what we're using now might change based on Garland's feedback and expertise. But, um, but yeah, it's a lot to keep track of. And you think about it, we add up a lot of these digital resources pretty quickly sure. without a real plan in place. Because yeah. they just needed to they be were free. Yeah, oh, they, that's how they got it. Because that's how they got it. 
You know, exactly. oh, we're giving everything free now. Yeah. And then we get dependent on it and mm -hmm. then we pay for it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Although we did get a nice grant from uh, Desi this year to, for, to keep most of what we're doing for our math program this year, even though we already have it in place, um, they're giving us a break and they're, they're giving us money to cover the iReady that we brought on board. And they're, they purchased, um, I was able to um, pay for our uh, full year of illustrative math. And then I was also able to buy some student workbooks, which I hadn't done in the past. Probably because I wasn't sure if I wanted them, but I think this is a good opportunity Moving to try it out. Forward, for free, we're not so. going to have that the extra money that we've been leaning right. on for things like that. So I do think that we need to kind of look forward into the future because you're absolutely right. The way that we purchase curricular materials is different. And can you explain to them what Open Syed is? Sure. Uh, so Open Syed is the, is a is a curriculum that's a storyline, um, phenomenon based instruction. And I'm pretty sure everybody here heard me talk about it at the retreat. But it's basically a way to approach um, science instruction. Family, you're going to do a better job describing <laughs> this than I am. But that um, introduces topics to students in a way that that unfolds like a story so that they're eager to learn more about something and that it makes sense to them as the topics build it, from the student's perspective, not the teacher who knows all this stuff and understands how these things fit together, but from a, teach, a student perspective. And it's very, um, it's very um, inquiry driven yeah. and it's got these science and engineering practice standards embedded and they do a great job. And I will tell you what, the only thing you have to purchase, and this is another thing we have to think about, is all the stuff yes. that goes with it. I mean, at yes. one point, I'm got, I've got Beth Grady with the big Y card going to get raw chicken wings from the big Y because it's just the volume of, of just stuff. And some of it is a one-time purchase or, a, a, you know, like a durable thing, like a microscope or something like that. But some of the things are... You know, like super super yeah. you know, stuff like that. Chicken, yeah. and chicken wings, like which sounds super engaging. Like I can't wait to see that lesson myself. So, um, but um, but that's also something to plan for because it's yeah, the curriculum's free, but not all the stuff that you have to have to be prepared to do it. So we'll have to come up with a like a again a chart of things that we'll need to order year after year and budget for that. Yeah. And that and that's new for us. Part of my budget, but I forgot that. Yes, my consumable Yeah, it's a lot of stuff. <laughs> We, we got the, so the, with the best deal though, I was so thrilled about this because Steve's kept teaching me all about how to follow this RFP process and, and everything else to use all this great money. But anyhow, the cheapest uh, bid has everything organized so well. So like if you're on a unit and a lesson, like you get the QR code, the box, and it tells you exactly what's in it and what you need. And it's organized by baggie for like, so you can just hand it out to the kids. That made me feel a little less anxious. Hopefully, it will for teachers as well. So. Any other questions? It's remembering really the order of paramecia two weeks in advance, which be them in time and who can use that. different words here. Words. <laughs> Dead frogs and Uncle the, Jim's word. Well, I had my rot in the yeah, oh, I, I used to, <laughs> Beth Grade, it used to be the teacher in the classroom next to mine, and I'd sometimes call thinking I was something burning down, and she's not, no, don't call them. I'm doing this experiment in here. Like, fun, but a little too. Who unstructured? <laughs> <laughs> dissect out oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, that's all for educational presentations. If anybody has any more questions before we move on, while our team leaders are here. All right. Uh oh, where's my script? Okay. <laughs> Turn it over. Okay. Policies. So we're in luck. There's no policies this Yay. evening. Um, we do have some action items. Yes. Uh, move to approve the Southwick Regional School fundraisers for the 22-23 school year. <laughs> Drama Club gift basket raffle, class of 2024 turkey trot, raise of hope donation collection, class of 2025 movie night, class of 2026 Rams calendar sales, and class of 2024 bake sale recommended. So move. Second. Um, Second. 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 Any questions? All right, so take a vote to approve the fundraisers. Do I need to read that whole thing or is that good enough? Okay. <laughs> All right, show hands. Okay, that passes. Five, there we go. Six. Six. Zero, zero. Thanks. Six. 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 Good Move to approve the 2223 STG RSD district calendar revisions 1.4 recommended. So moved. 
questions on that one? These are just those great. See, yes. that's yes. just that the, what Joe presented last week, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Um, show of hands. That's the six zero zero. Uh, move to approve the superintendent goals for the 22-23 school year. Recommend it. Recommend that you know my so moved. <laughs> well, I guess you are recommending it. <laughs> Any questions? Let's talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chubb, do you have any questions? Mm, not well, he's been me now. <laughs> what time is it? Thank you. Get up on the hill here. All right, I'll take a show of hands for that one. That one passes. And um, no, she has to I go. It. Okay, okay. move to approve the transfers of, of appropriations for fiscal year 2022 as recommended by the finance subcommittee and shown on the attached list. Uh, the action item requires the transfer of FY22 budget appropriations between accounts and programs to eliminate specific account and program deficits resulting from actual expenditures over the course of the fiscal year. This is a housekeeping item to maintain compliance with the school district's policy DBJ recommend. So moved. Second. This is pretty standard procedure. Does anybody have any questions about this one? No. All right. All hands passes six zero zero, and that brings us to our report, Superintendent Willard. So I just wanted to let you know that we do have some changes coming to the central office. We've had some resignations. Um, the good thing is people are resigning because they've been promoted, uh, which is what we'd love to see in our district because we're growing leaders. Um, but in central office. Uh, we know that Steve is retiring at the end of the month, along with Steve, um, our accountant, Michelle Grisey. She became the new director of finance and operations for the Wachusett Regional School District. And Annie Larkham, our HR specialist, uh, became the promoted to the director of personnel for the city of Westfield. So um, we have people who are leaving us um, for bigger and better things, but it is going to have an impact on central office. Um, we also have somebody who's going to be leaving um, for a few weeks in our business office, but hopefully we'll be back um, before uh, Steve and Michelle depart. Um, but I do want to let you know that um, I did meet with the union today. We're working on transition plans, um, putting things in place. Um, but it, it's going to be the biggest shift I've had as superintendent in um, this is my seventh year. So um, we're going to work together. We're going to we might hit some bumps in the road, but we're going to get through it. And um, we're even with these resignations, we're kind of looking at how we can um, tweak these vacancies. Um, and so we may be bringing to you at our next school committee meeting some updated job descriptions because whenever people leave, it's always an opportunity to switch things around and change things up a little bit. Um, and so we're looking at that right now as a central office team. So I may be bringing some updated job descriptions um, to you uh, at the next school committee meeting. And when are those two, Michelle and Annie, leave? So Michelle is leaving the same day as Steve. Um, it's right before Thanksgiving. And Annie is leaving on November 10th, the day before Veterans Day. Okay, so they're happening quickly. Yes. And um, so you would likely come to us next meeting with revised job descriptions and then we would post? So that's a great question. So um, we had our central office admin team meeting and we wanted to get the postings out there sooner rather than later and we don't have time to update them. So Jenny Sullivan had a great idea and she's like, can we just post them as is and then um, get them revised and then repost them so that at least we're getting them out there and we're getting applicants to apply? Yes, we can. So we're gonna just post them as is. There's really not a lot that we're gonna be changing in the accountant one and nothing too significant in the HR one. Um, so they're, they're, they're gonna be minor tweaks, so it's not that big, um, but at least we're gonna get the um, job postings out there and we're gonna start getting applicants in so that we can start doing interviews sooner rather than later. Um, and so when are, when are you posting, like this week? Uh, she may have posted today okay. or tomorrow. I know she gave Steve one to look at, but we can't change it. So I just told her just to post it and then we'll 
review will be there. So uh, soon, soon, soon. Yes. Um, the other thing I wanted to do is um, set a date for the budget roundtable. Um, we have a lot to discuss this year at the budget roundtable. Just some information that's coming in from Boston on um, um, sped out of district in, uh, rates going up and potential. Um, they're talking about health insurance rates going up dramatically. Um, they're talking about a lot of fixed cost increases going up. And we're also in negotiation. So I really want to set a, date, a date for the budget roundtable sooner rather than later. Um, I'd love to do it while Steve is still here because he's got a, a really good handle on um, where we are and how our budgets work. And I think it would be good for our um, select board members to have a final meeting with him because it would be the most effective meeting. So, but the budget round table is where we meet with, um, it's part of our regional agreement and we meet with all of the FinCom team, FinCom committees of our three districts and also the select board members. Mm -hmm. And we kind of just get together and we talk about, they tell us things that might be coming up that we should be aware of. And we tell them things that we might be aware of that are happening so that there's no surprises. It's just an effort to keep everybody on the same page. And it's most helpful if all of the members of FinCon and the select board come from all three towns. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't always happen. So um, anything that we can do to be in communication with those people and encourage them as well as us to attend. It's just, it's one of those things where because we're a regional school district, it makes us different from a new mm -hmm. municipality. And because we, we partner with all three towns and we need the votes of all three towns, it is important that we have those early communications mm -hmm. to know what, you know, what's coming down the pipeline. Right. Um, it would be awesome. Is it just the members of the finance sub? Anybody can come. Anybody. So it is an open meeting, yes. Mm -hmm. And we invite the finance um, committees and the select board members of all three towns. Mm -hmm. so we get each other pretty good for them. Town administrators. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, so you want to set a date now? Is that what you're looking no, for? No, I'm going to have Amy send out one of the, okay. I just want to give you a heads up. What it, what it is and why I think it's really important that we get it in before Steve leaves. So I'm just it's, I'm just giving you a heads up. Um, Amy's going to send some dates. She's going to do it kind of like what we did for the director of finance and operations, the one that most people can come to. Mm -hmm. That's the one we're going to choose, and that's the way we're going to um, go forward. With it, okay. I don't know if this is possible, but mm -hmm. it would be really awesome if um, we could have our new director of finance and operations with us on that evening. Well. I will do my best. That would be yeah, that is actually a great idea. So yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So that brings us to Mr. Presnell. Yeah, nothing, nothing really to report other than we're still full speed ahead trying to wrap up some things, get the annual audit finalized, um, approving these transfers allows us to provide them with a um, final uh, budget to actual report on our FY22 budget. So they incorporate that into the um, audited financial statement report. So uh, we'll ship that off to them tomorrow. Um, so we anticipate that being wrapped up in the next couple of weeks. Um, at, if there's a opportunity to get them in here and present to the committee before I leave. I'd love to do that. I'm not sure if the time is going to work or not, but we'll try to make that happen. Uh, Michelle and I are plugging away on our end of year financial report that we owe to DESE um, and uh, trying to get that wrapped up this week, but it's just always something to kind of derail our efforts. Um, and That's it. You know, trying to clean up some of the remaining um, project type procurement uh, tasks that we have. And I'm probably not going to get to all of them, but we'll get to at least some of them done and put a good list together for uh, for my successor. So he's got a little bit of a roadmap on, on what he needs to do, what's, what's hanging out there that, that still needs attention. Thank you. 
All right, subcommittee so use and liaisons. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to hear about negotiations. Um, Mr. Locke, Mr. Doe. I was not able to make the last meeting, but I know we meet, uh, I believe, on Monday, this coming Monday. It's going slow. And that's all. There isn't much to report. Okay. Um, so I. Going slow. Um, <laughs> are the is the teacher's contract expired and are they working well, on the old contract? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're they're currently working. Working. No, the under under the existing. Under the existing. Yes. It expired yeah. last year. Correct. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, finance. Uh, finance subcommittee met on the seventh. Uh, we covered the FY22 uh, year-end budget results, talked about these appropriation transfers, our uh, <clears throat> net school spending, and that we're, we're meeting that requirement, um, the uh, status of the audit, our um, end-of-year report, uh, excess and deficiency projection for 630.22. And for those numbers that aren't familiar with it, that's essentially equivalent to our free cash that the towns would, would have. Um, and uh, I reported, I anticipate that being, you know, just under what the, mac the uh, maximum is that we can carry. So we'll be in good shape with respect to the ED balance. As well as uh, some of our revolving accounts will be uh, you know, when they're officially recognized either through the audit process or with the EB certification, they'll, they'll be affected at some pretty high levels. Um, a few things we, <laughs> we didn't get to on the group insurance. I know Jen just mentioned um, about some of the inflationary pressures and so forth. I can report, um, Michelle and I met with the representative from the Maya Health Trust, which is where we purchase our group health insurance and dental insurance from. Our, our group's experience has been um, very good uh, for the previous plan year and thus far in the current plan year. So um, that can help mitigate uh, some potential increases there. The way they rate, the way they um, come up with increases for our, our group, it's a blend of our own group's experience and the overall Maya Health Trust, all, all the other municipalities and school districts that they do business with. Um, so they take a combination of that and uh, from that come up with a, uh, a rate for us. And obviously some trends in, in healthcare spending go into that. So I'm optimistic that you're not gonna get clobbered next, okay. next spring when they come out with a, a new rate. Um, We'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to pay close attention to that. I have a question, Steve. Mm -hmm. And somebody asked it to me the other day. Our fuel, when we were at a meeting, our fuel costs, do we like lock in the yeah, price? We're, we're locked in on the contract pricing for um, natural gas, which is our mm -hmm. uh, fuel source for all of our HVAC, our heating system, mm -hmm. um, and electricity as well. For just this year, or do we do it multi years? Um, multi years. Typically, okay. it, we're doing it for two or three years, to, uh, depending on you know, what what it looks like. Um, uh, and I couldn't tell you the exact dates, but you're covered at least through uh, this fiscal year, and I think next fiscal year. Um, one of them, I think they're they're time to expire at the same time. It's a little over now. Um, so one's going to run a little longer. That's, that's our gas and our electricity. Yes. Okay, thank you. I just yeah. I wanted to know that. It gets brought up at the uh, superintendent yeah. meeting. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. oh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We're, we're we're locked in, and we did see increases from the previous contract period that we had, but uh, it wasn't it wasn't just it wasn't super difficult. Um, I don't know what you're going to be looking at next time around. Right. And I know Mr. Locke has been concerned about yes. the, the validity of those contracts, whether they'll hold up if the, if the market yeah, becomes just because so, we're, you've got this out there. I know. Uh, I know. They, they could they could pull it right out from underneath us. So far, so there's been no pulling. Yeah. But, but these are things we need to be planning for when we plan for the next budget. And these are the yeah. things we need to talk about at the budget roundtable. Well, some of the transfers here that you just 
that you just approved. Uh, several of them deal with uh, utilities on the electricity side, where because of the pandemic and uh, the guidance that we were receiving around as much air airflow and bringing in fresh air, we're running systems, um, HVAC systems, a lot more than what we typically would. So that's kind of where we got we got hit on uh, a couple of the. Uh, are we still right. running our HVAC systems at that? We level? are not at the same level that we were during the height of the pandemic, but, but higher we are than higher we than pre-pandemic. Uh -huh. yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Um, anything else? Finance or we're moving on to LP to EC? That's tomorrow. Okay. Um, policy, we were supposed to meet today, um, but that meeting was canceled and needs to be, we need to reschedule and kind of put together a plan. But, uh, we're going to meet in November and set the plan. Okay, so when's the next one? November 15th. 15th. All right, and then buildings and grounds. Nothing really. I have something quick though. I did meet, um, and it was just by chance because I was at the MGC show. Oh, yeah. And I happened to um, run into Steve and um, Eric and Gabe, uh, Garland. Galen Garland. Um, and he did talk to me, they all talked to me a little bit about furniture in terms of what could we do to make the power in the classrooms for all of the one-to-one -one notebooks because the kids aren't charging them when they're at home. And so how could we potentially fix that problem without having to have a um, surge protector with 500 <laughs> going into yeah, that, that is a little, that's <laughs> not up to code. Um, yeah. <laughs> And so there's very easy ways to do it. Of course, none of them come cost free, but there are some tables that are already there, which happened to have been sold by me long ago. And um, we can outfit those with, there's already poles for grommets, but we can actually outfit those with um, power ports and then daisy chain tables together. So. Great. Yeah. And that would be minimal cost. That's great. But it wasn't a building and grounds meeting. It just happened to be out of I was a vendor at a show, and lo and behold, they were there. <laughs> um, the rest of these are all liaisons. Any liaisons have anything that they would like to pipe in? No. All right. So it is now time for our second public comment. Mrs. Sullivan, is there anything you'd like to add? Or we get? <laughs> all right. I think we're good. Okay, um, and okay, I don't believe that we have anything for committee discussion or, or new business. So I will now entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Okay. And roll call vote. So pass. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Be heard. Ryan. Yes. Erica, yes. And Desiree. Yes. And I'm yes. That vote passes zero zero. <laughs>